Ms. Colton, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Chair Webster. Thank you so much to all of our witnesses today. Uh, apologize for the gravelly voice. I'm not sick. I lost my voice cheering for our beloved Detroit Lions. Uh, <laughs> all grit. Um, we really want to thank you for uh, your testimony. This is an incredibly precarious time uh, in our world and in the Red Sea. While the humanitarian impacts are deeply felt uh, across uh, the globe, constituents back home are also concerned about the deep economic impact that this will have, as they're already struggling with hyperinflation and putting food on the table. I have a series of economic questions uh, about the, the impacts uh, of, of this war and also what uh, what we can do about it here in Congress. So my first question uh, is for Mr. Gold. Our economy is still recovering from supply chain shortages uh, that we experienced after the pandemic. Um, with some industries still struggling to access essential components. Uh, from our national GDP to increased operating costs for maritime shipping, do you have an estimated cost to our economy if the route through the Red Sea is no longer a viable option? Thank you for the, for the question. Unfortunately, we do not have an estimate at this point in time. I think there's so many variables as to what the actual impact would be. I think as Mr. Dar noted, the supply chain will adjust and will adapt. And I think you have to figure out what those additional costs will be. We are seeing some of those costs that are being passed along now, especially to small and medium-sized enterprises who don't have the ability to negotiate and push those costs off. Um, but again, as we're in a new negotiating cycle for new contracts, that's going to be an impact. The impact on congestion at our ports, if that does materialize, is going to have an impact as well. So I think, again, preparing for what's to come is where we need to be doing a lot of focus now. I agree with Mr. Dar that the focus on infrastructure, both on kind of the land side, but also through the gate, is critically important. But also looking at kind of the IT systems as well. I think one of the areas where we kind of failed throughout the pandemic was that communication aspect, which is so critical amongst mm -hmm. supply chain partners. The ability to know what's coming in and when and how it's going to transit through the supply chain is incredibly important. And unfortunately, we haven't seen that progress yet on that aspect of this to be able to plan accordingly. Thank you. Mr. Dar, you mentioned your hopefulness that Congress's investments in port and landside infrastructure included in the bipartisan infrastructure law will increase capacity and resiliency. Can you talk a little bit more about how some of those investments uh, can help us cope? Yes, ma'am. Um, those investments in large part at the port level, let me give you an example. Um, in the US, we are largely constrained by the geography of the ports and the terminals that we have. And so um, to build a new terminal, while not impossible, is very, very difficult. And they tend to encroach upon you know, other users of that land space. So the more we can do to densify the operations in the terminals and make them more efficient, uh, while also, I should point out in our company's model, maintaining the workforce, because uh, it can be done and it can be done effectively because the volumes go up, uh, that's a good start. And being as um, thoughtful as possible about those sorts of investments in particular, I think helps us the most because also, some of those investments can be done faster than to say, identify a new site and then all that goes with that. Um, and it is a lot that goes with that and building that out. Um, second, I would say the road infrastructure needs huge work. Um, and uh, the rail uh, operators also um, need uh, whatever incentivization is there to maintain additional surge capacity to meet the rail networks, because whatever we can put the rail network needs, because whatever we can put on rail mm -hmm. is avoided going on the roads and overstressing that again. It's all a part of uh, the, the shipping and transport uh, larger ecosystem. What other suggestions do you have for us in, in Congress, obviously, uh, Containing the conflict, ending the conflict is a is a major uh, path to to ending or to maintaining this route through the Red Sea. But in the interim, uh, this is a a daily problem. What can we do here in Congress to help make sure um, that we are supporting the industry? 
Um, so again, I'll, I'll start with maybe what you didn't want me to focus on, but I think it is important. The shooting has to stop. It has to be safe enough for us to send our sons or daughters or people that have trusted their lives to us into that region. When it comes to what we can do day to day, we have what we have, and we have a substantially altered uh, series of networks trying to deliver the cargo, and I would say being as prepared as possible from retail shelving all the way down to the key side will help us avoid another situation like we had during the pandemic. Yeah. But I want to be very clear. The scale of this disruption comes at a better time when there is additional capacity both at sea and ashore. And second, the scale of the cost excursions, the underlying expenses to us to operate that have to find their way into the market is to this point nowhere near what it was during the pandemic. It happened very quickly, right. but if you look at what the analysts are putting out there, uh, we may have seen the top in some of the markets, uh, not for me to speculate on, but you, you can review that yourself. And then lastly, um, that on the export trades are under a lot less stress and, and price pressure. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the additional time. Yield. Oh, I yield. 